Welcome to an introduction to economics brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For further information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This podcast is the second in our series on money. There are various ways of measuring money, and each method then has further uses. We will start with one of the easier measures, which is a simple measure of the notes and coin in circulation plus the amount being held in the banking system. This is known as M0. From this definition we can see that we are excluding anything that is not note or coin. To take the deposits at bank into account we use the money stock. The money stock is equal to the money multiplier multiplied by the monetary base. More usefully we calculate the money multiplier as the ratio of money stock to money base. The money monetary base equals the cash in circulation plus the cash held at banks. H equals C plus R. The reserves are a fraction of deposits the bank will hold. The fraction is CB. So R equals CB multiplied by D, where D equals total deposits. The cash is also a fraction, CP, of the deposits. So C equals CP multiplied by D. Thus, if H equals C plus R, then H equals CP plus CB multiplied by D. Money supply, or money stock, is the sum of circulating money plus deposits. M equals C plus D. So, since C equals CP times D, then M equals CP plus 1 times D. The ratio of M to H is the money multiplier, M divided by H, which gives us CP plus 1 divided by CP plus CB. There are various measures of money. The most important point to note is that the money supply is equal to the cash in circulation plus bank deposits. The question then arises, which deposits do we consider? This is how we end up with different measures of money. They are known as M0 through M4. We shall remind ourselves of earlier definitions here. Retail deposits are those at the high street banks, and wholesale deposits are those relating to corporate depositors. The retail deposits can be divided into site deposits and time deposits. Our first measure was M0, which we have just met. This is the sum of the notes and coin in circulation, plus the quantity held in the banking system. Now, this may look complicated, but it's actually simple. Take the cash as coin and notes at the bank and remove these. You are left with coin and note in circulation, to which we then add site deposits. This gives us a value for M1. The M2 value is similar. We start with cash in circulation outside the banks, then add only the retail deposits, but we now also include shares in building societies. This equals M2. The measure known as M3 starts with the value for M1 and then adds in any private sector time deposits or certificates of deposits. This gives a value for M3. Finally, a value for M4, which starts with a value for M3, then adds in shares in building societies and then removes cash holdings from building societies and bank deposits and bank certificates of deposit. Finally, for definitions, you will come across the terms broad and narrow money. Narrow money refers to the balances we have for everyday spending, whilst broad money includes both the cash we hold for transactions and for a form of savings. The term deregulation became popular in the 1980s and 1990s. Financial deregulation was supposed to encourage competition between banks and allow new banks into the market. The belief was that interest rates on loans would fall and rates on savings would rise. There would be an equilibrium point where the marginal revenue should be equal to the marginal costs. Initially, a number of building societies became banks and some new banks were formed. But in the last decade, the pattern has been for mergers, thus reducing choice for the consumer. Why should we want to hold money as cash? There are several reasons for this. First, however, we should accept that there is a cost to holding money as cash. The simplest measurement is that the cost of holding money is the interest that is given up by holding money and not investing it in some form that pays better interest. We do need some money as cash, since if we go to the market then we don't want to have to stand there and barter. This is the transaction motive for holding money. 
We also hold some cash as a precaution, which can be useful when we arrive at a gas station in a rural area, only to discover that they don't accept debit or credit cards and the owners only accept cash. Finally, there are people who do not wish to take the risk of holding an asset in the form of company stock, so they prefer the safety of cash. How much money do we want to hold as cash? Our ideas from economics suggest people will hold money up until the point where the marginal benefit of holding another pound is equal to its marginal cost. The chart shows a horizontal axis for real money, note and coin. The vertical axis shows marginal costs and marginal benefits. If we hold too much money as bonds or other assets that have low liquidity, then we could have problems if we suddenly need cash. The desired money holding here is E, representing the point where the marginal cost curve intersects the marginal benefit curve from below. If the interest rates on bonds rises, then the marginal cost curve shifts from MC to MC dash. The new equilibrium point is now E dash. The desire to hold real money falls from L to L dash. A rise in real income shows a shift in marginal benefit to E double dash and a rise in the demand for real money holding from L to L double dash. The argument being followed here is that more transactions will be carried out and increase the demand for real money. Just before we finish this section, note that an increase in wealth can mean more wealth is invested in other assets, reducing the demand for real money. More time deposits will be demanded. This is the end of our second podcast on money, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.